Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm going to take this off, okay, while I'm talking. Good evening, everyone. I, I want to welcome you to uh, this special program and celebration of Black History Month. Uh, my name is Valerie Bell, and I'm the director of the Athens Regional Library System. Uh, many thanks needs to go out to Van Burns. He's back there. Uh, but he organized this special program in honor of Black History Month for the library. Um, tonight will be a panel discussion among four artists from different disciplines about what it means to be an African-American visual artist in Athens. Very timely and interesting. At this time, though, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our panel, Lemuel LaRoche, better known as Life the Griot. Life is no stranger to us at the library. He's the founder and executive director of Tresson Community, a nonprofit youth empowerment organization dedicated to developing strategic leadership skills in young people. Uh, they meet here weekly uh, on Mondays, and uh, Life is also internationally renowned for his poetry, which he uses as a tool for empowerment, reconditioning, and community outreach. Uh, Life holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Georgia and is the author of two books that maybe he'll tell you more about. So without further ado, welcome, thank you for coming, and here's Life the Griot. Hello, good evening. Come on, I've heard Roaches talk louder than that. Good evening. This is about really relaxed. We are in a room full of artists, right? And if we can do anything, we should be able to relax. Because one thing about the artists is they're going to pour what is coming from inside of them, and they're going to color the world and share that with us all, right? So once I want to thank, let's take a moment to thank uh, Valerie, uh, Mrs. Bell, as well as uh, Mr. Van for having the vision to to create and establish something, a platform for artists to express themselves and to talk about some of their work. Because I always say, there are so many unsung heroes. We know about the sung heroes, the people that everyone wants us to look at, the people that paved the way forward. But then we have the unsung heroes, the ones that sit in the crevice of the world, the, the ones that create murals that inspires the average person that has to walk through communities where they don't feel hope, the ones that create or uh, wear clothes and just different style that can inspire us all. So I appreciate you all for recognizing the need to create something like this. And I recognize as well that I like to color the words. I'm not an artist, right? I would say I am an artist. I, have a, I come from a family of artists. They can draw their behinds off. <laughs> but I was given the power of drawing with words. So I try to have poetry, and I try to paint pictures with my words, right? But I also wanted to bring up with me a co-moderator, right? A sister in this community that is on the front line. She's doing a lot of great work with the DA's office. And she's not only doing the hard work in the community, she uses art as a platform and as a tool for her to release. Art has a way of releasing those things that we bottle inside of us. And we can give that and share that with the world. So I want to take a moment to also introduce my co-host, my, my co-moderator, Ms. Markeisha Ross. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight. I was asked by Mr. Life. Um, and I was like, sure, why not? I, I really value these artists. I know... I want to say two of them, but I want to get to know more. And I'm here tonight to kind of bring in questions about how they feel about the Athens community art and how it's spread it throughout the community. So I thank y'all for allowing me to be here. All right. Okay. Okay. So um, I think to, to start, I think it's extremely important. Let's give the artists an opportunity to just introduce yourself. Right? We know who you are, right? But allow... I want you to, to introduce yourself in your own creative, colorful way, all right? Now, I warn you, as an artist, I'm an artist, so I love to talk, and I can talk an entire hour, right? So as an artist, I know we have so much to share, but just give us a brief introduction of who you are 
if anything, what type of art that you uh, create and if anything, a little inspiration. What inspired this art? So do we want to go tic-tac-toe, figure it out, or are we just going to start with Brother Broderick? Let's go. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, ladies first. I'm going right? to say ladies first. Let, yeah. let, 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 please introduce yourself. Okay. Starting with the old bra. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Carl Rainey. Um, um, in Athens, I'm known as Pamela Rainey, but I took the name Carr when I started uh, painting because I didn't want anybody to know I was doing that because I didn't believe I was that good. Uh, my son actually um, inspired me to paint because I, he was um, a budding artist in high school and he went off to school at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and uh, I asked him to paint me three pairs and he told me, paint me yourself. No. <laughs> and, you know, I couldn't do anything to him because he was he was grown and off to school. So you know, I decided to go off and learn how to paint three pairs, of, you know, on my own. And so I started going to classes um, all over the country. My medium is watercolor. Mm. Went to school, took classes in Europe, Costa Rica, around the Athens area. Um, in Georgia O'Keeffe's hometown in New Mexico, mm. and um, really got a grasp for watercolor. You never really learn it, but you know, you're always out there sloshing that water around. And when I did, I painted three pairs, and um, I had it framed and gave it to my son. Ooh, and he nice. thought it was really, really good, you know, and that was, that was great for me, because even now, he, is my biggest fan. He loves the work that I do, and he'll say, can I have that? Can I have that? And I have a lot of artist friends um, who, who's my age, who my age, and, and uh, they can't give their stuff away to their kids, but, but uh, my son, bless his heart, he loves, he loves my work. And uh, that's the main thing that pleased me, and so I connected myself with the Linden House here in Athens, and I started joining art um, venues and clubs and organizations and started meeting different people. Um, met Broderick <laughs> at the Lindman House and you meet so many different people and so that's why um, I'm here, met Van. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the people I met when, I, when it goes back around. Some of the people I met who um, inspired me, Rodriguez Davis, um, Marie Cochran, those kind of folks. So, but I'll I'll stop because you think you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's me. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's give us some love, right? Hi, I'm Tabitha Felto. I'm a fashion designer. I'm self-taught. I've been designing for about eight years now. Um, I have a mother of four. It's really important to me, and a wife. My husband. Um, let's see, I'm not as well lived as Ms. Parr here, but um, I really do enjoy designing. I also um, mentor and teach at Linden Art Center as well. Um, every Tuesday evenings, I teach there and mentor the kids in fashion design. Um, I design for two different brands. So, one brand is my name, is Tabitha Felto, which is more of a chic. Um, sophisticated looks that are for evening wear to everyday wear to your prom to bridal and then I also design for a different brand which is called Chic Ride which we co-run together and it's um, women's motorcycle gear so women's motorcycle gear from their jackets to your pants um, now we're coming up with gloves as well so Ooh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Broderick Flanagan. Oh, wow. oh, I'm sorry. No, it's a pity. Yeah, it's a pity. I, I didn't realize. I didn't realize. My bad. Go no, go ahead. No, no. Let's do it. I thought you got all the pads, so I thought you were going to get you. We are our parents. Yeah, yeah. We do our parents. How you guys doing? My name is Kit Felto. No relation. Um, I'm actually a photographer. I specialize in food, and I don't know where to look. I specialize in food and products. Um, I actually started off at, um, in beauty and fashion, and that kind of um, 
kind of strayed away to doing food and products. But um, everybody here is all like sophisticated. I'm just a regular guy, just shooting, creating art, and everybody's inspiring everybody. Mm -hmm. inspiring everybody. <laughs> but uh, that's basically me in a nutshell: photographer, food, and products. And um, yes, my boo, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is it my turn? No? Yeah, okay. got it, got it. <laughs> um, yes, good evening, everyone. Broderick Flanagan, um, born and raised here in Athens, Georgia. Um, I work mostly in oils and acrylic paints. Uh, do a lot of figurative work, um, capturing the black uh, experience in America. Um, that's really kind of my f main focus for my studio art practice. Um, and I'm you know, still learning, self-taught artists. I go to a lot of workshops and, you know, over the years got involved with a lot of Athens organizations to kind of hone in on my craft and learn more about the industry, um, including the Linden House Art Center, Athens Area Arts Council, some of the early organizations I got involved with um, on the art scene, um, did a lot of networking, kind of just pounding the pavement. Um, and early on, like in my life, I used art as like a coping mechanism to really kind of deal with some of the traumas I was experiencing in my childhood. And I didn't even think I could make a career as an artist. Um, but once I got past that fear-based kind of mentality, uh, I really jumped in and dove in head first and really kind of put all of my energy into that. Um, and so I'm inspired by a lot of things, by people. Um, I also do a lot of like community engagement through the arts and my artistic practice, doing a lot of mural making, uh, created a couple of programs for teenagers, have done summer camps over the years. Um, really, that's one of the things that I think, uh, I think the most about these days is like how to incorporate and, and bring in community into my, some of my projects, the public projects that I do. Um, that is a big part of what inspires me and brings me a lot of joy in that space. Um, working on a pr project now at um, Howard B. Stroud Elementary that I'm excited about. Um, it's one of the first times that I've been able to really take the student's art and mesh it together with the overall like uh, public art piece or mural in a way that allows them to put their original marks on the wall and leave the marks there. And so to give you a kind of like a paint a picture, I guess, <laughs> like life was speaking to with the words, it's a, a mural of uh, three African-American women um, and they're sewing a quilt together, uh, kind of reminiscent of the G's Bend and, and the women there in that quilting collective. And on the quilt that they're knitting, um, there are like sections or squares. Um, it's not perfect squares because it's like kind of a flowing quilt, but there are shapes or sections that the students um, were, were able to put their artwork into, uh, partnering with the art teacher there at the elementary school. and. Um, Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's turning out even better than I expected. Mm -hmm. So it's at Howard B. Stroud Elementary School. And uh, if you get a chance, definitely go by there and, and check it out. Okay, let's give them a round of applause, right? right? So this is uh, the rules. This is how we're going to do this, right? We're going to um, ask uh, the panelists some questions. And the whole idea is to, I'm going to try to draw just deeper response. And I wanted the audience to get an opportunity to walk through the Athens community, uh, through some of the shoes and some of the experience of these artists. But I want to open up with the words of uh, a quote from Marina uh, Abramovic. And she said, I realize the power of art that does, that does not hang on the walls of galleries. I realize the power of art that does not hang on the walls of galleries, right? And I want to just kind of begin to open up to say, ask you all, what is it like to be a African American artist in this Afri in this um, Athens community, right? There is so much, right? When people tend to see us, it comes we they see us through so many different lenses, right? But you, as an artist, you stand in this unique space. But what is it like to be an artist in Athens? Do you feel it's an environment that supports black African-American artists? I'm throwing the ball up. Whoever want to dunk it, it's on you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I was asked that question before in an interview, like what does it mean to be a black artist? Um, and I, 
I didn't really get offended, but it kind of took me off base a little bit. You know, I mean, I'm an artist. I happen to be black, but, you know, I'm an artist. And so um, even though, like, in a lot of my politics, I do use identity a lot um, because black people are situated um, in mass at a, in a particular position, I feel like, in America, and there's a particular harm done to that population of people. And so... Um, with that being said, though, like it, it is a struggle in a lot of ways, but it's a struggle being an artist in general. But there's just extra layers to it sometimes, you know, when you walk uh, through the world with, with darker skin. And so um, I feel like more organizations and institutions are listening now uh, and in tune a little bit more than they have been in the past. Um, I've, I've been a part of a lot of conversations in that space, though, talking about how to include black artists in spaces with the Linden House, um, one conversation I remember was we were on a panel, it was uh, African, African American History Month, and we were talking about um, how to do inclusion was the basic question. And uh, myself and other panelists spoke to really kind of like just being intentional about reaching out to African American artists or artists of color outside of February. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, you know, it's, it's, it's but it, it, you'll be surprised that, you know, sometimes a lack of response. Um, but I, I mean, over the years, though, organizations have been doing better. Um, the Linden House um, has given me a solo show before, which I'm great, grateful for. Um, they have done, brought, brought in many artists over the years, um, you know, outside of Black History Month. Um, but they, you know, have also been making strides in bringing in black curators. Um, there was something that happened at the Georgia Museum of Art that I was really, really um, glad that happened. Um, they hired their first um, curator of, 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 of African diasporic arts um, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Sharnia Harris, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when institutions are intentional in that way and bringing in those different voices and perspectives, that's how you like truly begin to do diversity and inclusion by putting those resources behind hiring people um, that can help create that infrastructure. And then training other black um, curators and Latinx curators and, and, you know, the whole gambit. And so, yeah, it's, it's been a struggle to get to this point, though. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it, it plays tricks on, at least in my mind, it's like, okay, and are they not receptive to my work because I'm black? Or is it just my, my work not at the level that I think is, it should be at, you know? And so those are constant things that I wrestle with sometimes if I'm being, you know, vulnerable in this space. Um, when, I, when I approach white institutions or certain types of institutions. That's interesting. I appreciate the transparency. That was, that was deep. Thank you. And um, I'm going to actually pick up on something that you just now said. One of the things that bothered me a little bit is when, and again, I know we, we're, the, the panel, what we're discussing, but being labeled as, oh, you're a black artist, or you're a black photographer, or how does it feel to be a black? It's just like, I'm an artist first, you know? Right. And then it just so happens that I'm black. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things where I hear that all the time, where it's just like, you know, how does it feel being a black artist? Or, oh man, that's must, you know what it's like? One thing that bothers me a lot too, is like, if you go on Netflix, there's a section for like black movies, or it's just like, <laughs> Why can't we just be lumped in or black comedies? It's just like, yeah. yo, we do comedy. comedy. It's all comedy, right? <laughs> so it's the same thing where it's just like, it kind of bothers me a little bit. It's just being lumped in is like, yo, you're a black artist. And for me as a photographer, the work that I do, sometimes people don't realize that I am like just looking at my website unless they go to the About Me page. Because when I used to do shoot models, I had, you know, Asians, whites, blacks, Hispanics, everybody's just like, oh man, he must be a white old photographer. Come kind to of look at me, he's just like, oh, this is some young black guy. But it's one of those things when they, they realize that, they're like, oh, okay. I'm just like, why, why the oh? And like, why can't I take, you know, pictures like this? Like, I don't have to just take, and that's the thing, too. It's just like, for me, with my art, I always look for beauty. Right. And beauty comes in all shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. So when I used to shoot models, it was, if I see somebody and you catch my eye, I don't care what color you are, what shape you are, I'm going to shoot you. So... Looking at that, when they look at me and my, my bio, they're like, oh, he's, he's black. You know, it kind of shocks a lot of people. So what you said is just like, you know, we're artists first. That just so happens, you know, I'm a male. She's a female. She's a female artist. And it's just like one of those things where it's just like it is bothersome. But um, eh, what are we going to do about it? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. I mean, I agree that we are artists first. So I think if we recognize as artists outside of February, it's always <laughs> going to be great, you know, to be recognized for your work. So um, for me, um, I design from a perspective of just what I want to create. I don't see it any other way. Um, so what I think is beautiful, whether it's a dress or a gown or whatever it may be, whatever has sparked my attention or my creativity, I just go off that. And then, um, but I've been pretty well received. I think people just like clothing, you know, people finally, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you're like, oh, that tracked my eye, so I wanna buy this. Um, but I, I do most of my sales, like e-commerce, so it's all over you know, the United States. And um, I do have like more custom orders for my other brand, Tabitha Felto, and that's more like one-on-one -on -one with the client. And I've gotten white clients or black clients, but um, so I do feel appreciated in that sense, the value as an artist um, for design. And I think what I bring to it is that I'm creating a community of people who can see that we can be whatever you want to be, especially young black girls or young black boys even, that you know you can make this space for yourself where you can you know, grow yourself as an artist in clothing or fashion, or whatever, that you're not just one note, you have to do this one thing. Um, and so I have interns that I've interned and I think even with them, it's inspiring to them to see someone else, you know, like them. Um, well, I've had other interns too, but you know, not everybody's black. But, um, but just seeing themselves like, in me, you know, hopefully I inspired them and uh, until they inspire me to continue to do what I do. Um, but yeah, so I definitely, you know, love being black and never have not loved being black. And I'm an artist and I love being an artist. So it's pretty much how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. You inspired me. <laughs> That's a great question, by the way. Mm, just want to just want to share that with you. I am the only one on this stage who was born in Athens during the segregated period. Oh, I think that's different. Mm -hmm. I went to all black schools because we couldn't go to any other schools. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be very, very honest with you and very frank with you up here. Some mornings I wake up and I'm a black artist, and sometimes I, some mornings I wake up I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on how I feel mm -hmm. that particular time of the day based on mm -hmm. what experience is. Based on my experience. You know, I know that February was a week when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. It was Black History Week, mm -hmm. so we we moved up. <laughs> we got a month now. It's the shortest month of the year, but it's a month. And you know, I was in the exhibition at a uh, Linden House called Exile, Return from Exile. That was an exhibition for Native Americans, and I have Native American blood in me. And the curator saw one of my pieces at the Linden House and said, you got to be Native American when you painted that. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, you know, I'd always heard that, but we don't, we don't dwell on that. You know, when I was a little girl, oh, I'm dead. see my hair? You know, <laughs> you know it just, we just didn't dwell on that. We were black. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what people see first when they see me black. Mm -hmm. then, they, then they see female. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm happy to be black. Thrilled about it. Um, and I was in a, a show up in Pittsburgh for black folks called Common Ground. And it was an honor to be in that one too. And that was um, curated by Marie Cochran. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, for Appalachians. You know, uh, she did a play on the word Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And so um, I. It was, it was wonderful, but when I started here in Athens, there were no black artists of note that I know of. In fact, Charlene and Hunt and Hamilton Holmes, I was here on my way to church with my dad and mama when they were trying to integrate the University of Georgia hmm. and all the fires and all the smoke bombs and all that as we were going through town in our little car trying to get to church and they were just trying to go to school. So, I mean, that that's indelibly in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, to say from somewhere out of the blue, I want to be this artist, and it, it never occurred to me that anybody was better than me, because 
you know, we would go to New York every summer. Mother, was, mother would get us out of the South and mm -hmm. show us that there was another world, a better world someplace, that we didn't have to always be under somebody's foot. Mm -hmm. So I had grandparents and, you know, sisters, older sisters in New York. And that's where they sent us every summer. And so I wasn't here during the summer. Well, sometimes I was. Very few summers I was out in, in Athens. But I was at the beach. I was on the train. I was going to restaurants. I was doing all these things that, you know, come September when I jumped on the um, Silver Comet and got back, got my butt back here in Athens, I couldn't do those things again. All of that plays along with what the panel is saying. Because from those experiences, even though they didn't necessarily go through it, hadn't gone anywhere, it's still here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still here. It's not even disguised. It's just, you know, in a different format. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's still here. But I remember going through Black History Week, and we would <laughs> praise, you know, the achievement of black folks. And mm -hmm. there were people like uh, politicians and statesmen, of course, Martin Luther King, of course, uh, scientists, Book T. Washington educators, and then the sports people and the music folks as well. I don't ever, I was thinking about today, thinking about, I don't ever remember us having an artist that we <laughs> named. I mean, and I was thinking about, I, we didn't have an artist. And I know there were artists because, you know, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance was going on at that time. So they were there, they were painting, but we didn't have them here in Athens. Mm -hmm. And so what we've had to draw from here has, has been our own intellect, mm -hmm. our own passion, mm -hmm. our own ability to go beyond and not take what people give us, mm -hmm. but snatch it and say, you know, <laughs> that's us. I'm sorry. Those days are over. We can paint, we can draw, <laughs> we can do clothes, we can do whatever the heck we want to do. And, and uh, so... It was, a, it was inspirational for me to be invited here to this uh, panel tonight. And then when I accepted the invitation from my good friend, Van Burn, <laughs> I knew that I was <laughs> going to be like the oldest person up here. <laughs> and so it's, um, and, and I say to myself, it will be good to see young folks because I am so tired. I am tired of caring just. Banner, I can just <laughs> pass it off now, and, and they can carry it. I'll still be there, but I'm just so glad that this is being passed along. You know, it's, anybody ever seen the history, the, the movie The History Boys, uh, that British film where, you know, they, they get to the point where one of the professors tells the, the boys, pass it on. This, this education that you're getting, this knowledge that you're getting, don't keep it to yourself. Pass it on. And so it's, it's wonderful that I'm seeing all this being passed on now. Mm -hmm. And I can just rest and know that, um, you know, Athens is in good hands because we've got some talented black folks here, whatever you call yourself, black mm -hmm. artists, you know, uh, artists of color, Native American arts, whatever, never got the recognition. They're getting the recognition now. Uh, Broderick's in the jury show at the Linden House, you know, and <laughs> And you're working at the Linden House, you're doing, you know, it's, it's just a whole different thing from when I was a little girl. And thank yeah. God it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to throw a question out there because as an artist, um, I find myself here in Athens not really selling my work or telling people about my work. I think comparison sometimes is one thing. Um, putting a price on art is another thing. Um, but I wanted to ask y'all, how do you stay motivated? Like, through Black History, through Black Friday, you know, some of those, those holidays where they just say, okay, let's, let's go and support a black person. How do you stay motivated 365 days? And how do you, like, keep going if the income don't look the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. If the income don't come in. Right. <laughs> let, me, let me start it off this time, then we can just go down there. I know this sounds silly, but don't worry about the income. Mm. You, you can't worry about it because that will put you off every time. You'll stop doing whatever you're doing. You'll say, I've got all these pains and nobody's buying them. Well, there, you know, I was told when I was coming up and 
I ask that same question, they're not going to spoil. It's not like a bologna sandwich. Right. It's not going to spoil. <laughs> so point. you keep them and you put the price that you work on your work on your work, whether people want to buy it or not. That's up to them. But you never lower your standards. Right. You you. This is what I want for this, and that's what I want for this. I'm worth it. End of discussion. Right. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 But with any tap, would y'all like Anybody to? Ask? Yeah, I mean, there have been days I haven't sold. I haven't sold anything. I'm sorry. Um, and then there are days I sell a lot, and I'm really, really busy. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. Um, so I think those things keep motivated, knowing that it's appreciated from other people, and that people are buying it. And um, you know, the more we get our name out there to other people who can know who, what we're doing, what we're, you know, uh, what we're about, that always helps. You know, word of mouth or um, anything like that. But yeah, so I think when you know that somebody is appreciating your work, it keeps you motivated. And you know people that are attracted to it, whether it's from, hey, I like what you're doing, even if they don't, can't financially support it. Um, but all those things can be motivated. Um, and also having children <laughs> keeps me motivated because I, mean, I want them to have something that I can leave behind for them. So, right. for sure. And <clears throat> Um, being motivated, especially like when the cash is not coming in. Um, so before, when I like a couple of years after I started photography, I actually left my job, did photography full time because I said, you know what? I talked to my wife. She said, go ahead, full time. And of course, you lose motivation because nobody's hiring you, or you know, you're not getting paid the way you thought you she was going to be getting paid. And actually, you know. After like a year, how long was it? I don't know. After a year, I was just like, oh, it's time to get a regular job. But at the same time, I still decided to, to, to shoot for myself. And when I start to shoot for myself again, because before that, it was always like, like it was more of business. It wasn't art anymore. And I, I was talking to Tab about it, and I was just like, I don't like it. You know, like when I had to focus so much, so much on my business instead of creating, because I love to create. And when I actually got a regular job and I started shooting for myself again, I was just like, oh, this is... This is what I like. This is what I was missing. So the motivation, I'm not going to tell you get a regular job, but <laughs> it's just like, it's one of those things where it's just like if you, if you paint, if you draw, if you dance, if you sew, whatever it is, as long as you do it, you make yourself happy. If you don't make a dime, I'm the type of person where it's just like I could, because before this, I used to do music. And I don't care if nobody likes my music or if nobody likes my, my photos. I'm going to do it because it makes me happy. So as far as being motivated, you kind of have to, you can't do it for anybody else. You have to do it for yourself. And it's just like, and hopefully you have a strong support. You know, my wife is my support. So it's just like the times I got, I was like, oh man, nobody, you know, wants to work with me. And nobody is just, it's just like, you know, she was always there to support me. So I think a strong support is definitely one of them. And, you know, motivating yourself and believing in yourself. It's another. Um, yeah, all, all great answers, and I definitely resonate with uh, all of what was said. Um, for for me, I, I delved out into the art world as well. When I first got into the art world, I was working three jobs and meeting so much resistance down my first chosen career path. Um, I decided in a in a split moment almost to pursue art and try to pursue it as a career. So eventually I worked myself, networked myself in my way into being a full-time artist. And I was able to like give up the other jobs and positions. I wasn't making much money at those positions anyway. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, and so um, just, just being in that space and being in that position, um, it's not always about the money, but when you kind of figure out some type of way or formula, um, you have to get creative some, in some ways to bring in different streams of income. Um, I was fortunate enough to take a, a class on like uh, entrepreneurship and I put together a business plan and wrote down some of my goals and stuff and just worked until some of those goals started to manifest. You know, um, you have to put in the work. Uh, you cannot just sit back and, 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 and sit in your studio and paint. Um, and, but the, with everything that's balanced too, um, you, 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 you definitely want to be in the studio working, but then you also want to pay attention to how to put yourself out there as an artist if that's your goal with, with some of your work, which it was my goal to make money as an artist. And so uh, I began teaching classes, um, doing art programs, became proficient at grant writing, uh, wrote grants to organizations like AthFest Educates, Creature Comforts, Get Artistic Program. 
um, and began to put together different budgets for projects. I learned some of that stuff from being on the boards of directors at the Linden House and other organizations like that. Um, even though they weren't as diverse, I was still learning, soaking up information so I can take it back and do my own thing and share that knowledge with people in the community um, that I was connected to. And so um, there are ways to, to make it work um, as an artist. It just depends on what your, what your goals are and, and how much work you're willing to put in. And um, I do have a day job now. So I, I was a full-time artist for about five years, uh, maybe four or five years. And that's with a studio space and everything. So it, it, a lot of overhead came with that. So you really got to pound the pavement and, and, and put in work to make it happen um, on top of paying your own rent and supporting a, a daughter. Yeah. It gets hectic at times, you know. And so um, I remember my lights got cut off one time. Um, I'm sitting in, the, in my apartment, still painting by, by candlelight <laughs> uh, for about a month and a half, you know, taking cold showers. Um, but a lot of people don't know that part of my story because I don't share it that often, you know. I'm not there anymore in that space. But that's part of that struggle that I had to go through. And, like, you, should, you shouldn't have to go through that struggle, but some artists go through that, period. Um, where, it's, where it gets real dark. <laughs> you got to kind of pull yourself up out of that space. Um, and so, yeah, I say a lot of that to say, though, like, it, it really just depends. And like I said, I got a job when the pandemic hit, a full-time day job, because I didn't know what the art scene would look like. Um, and so I'm, I have a full-time salary position now, um, and uh, I still do my art as well, though. You know, so I'm doing both now. And actually, when the pandemic hit, the art really didn't slow down as much as I thought it would. Because uh, I was still writing a lot of proposals, submitting a lot of stuff to public art projects. Um, I got my first major solo project I, I did out in North Carolina. Um, but again, a lot of these things you, you have to kind of learn and put yourself out there, like how to write grants, how to submit proposals, how to apply for different residencies and different programs, like how to network and talk to people, you know. And so, um, yeah. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And as you were speaking, uh, a couple of things come to mind. Um, there's a movie called on Netflix called Really Love. If you haven't got a chance to see this, I'm encouraging every panelist to see this movie. It is a beautiful movie, and it's about an artist and his passion of choosing between his art, what he loves, and the woman he loves, mm -hmm. right? So sure. it's, it's a beautiful, well-written flick, and it's called Really Love. But as you were speaking, Broderick, um, I, I was reminded of uh, the words of uh, Julian uh, Beck. He said, the power of art is the power of truth, right? The power of art is the power of truth. And one of the things, uh, oftentimes we ask ourselves as artists, are we activists, right? Do we find that, because oftentimes when it comes with this black skin, right? You are, okay. You got you to gotta make a message. You got to paint something that can speak to the masses and it has to be deep. So as artists, do we find ourselves, do you consider yourself an activist? And if so, what's the cause? We maybe can start in the middle with Tabitha. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I teach my kids very much so. It's like we have a... We have a position, I guess, in this country, you know, being with black skin and loving that about yourself. So we have to um, move through here a certain way, right? Move this country a certain way. And so with that, you know, never be ashamed of who you are. Never think that you have to second guess what you want to do in life. Whatever you want to do, do it, you know, and do it with all your passion and might. And I think that's just how I raised them to be. So. Um, I always promote that with anyone I talk to, you know, as far as like any other uh, people I work with, any teams I work with, you know, if you, whatever you're doing, you know, do it all your um, might and all your passion. And sometimes it may cause you to be an activist, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. But um, for myself as an artist um, and as a designer, I mean, for me, I love clothing. I always like the, the way that you could shape different gowns or you can um, you know, drape the clothing on women, not men, sorry, men, not on two men clothing, just women. But I um, really am inspired to create something that I could um, you know, give to the world. So um, not necessarily that I'm an activist, but I definitely have times where I protest with my dollar. You know, where I, my money is how I, I feel like I'm an activist. Um, 
what I support, what I don't support. And it's anything that goes against what um, I am, my morals or anything like that, I, I won't support it. I'm just not going to. I'm not going to support my, my money. I don't care if they like, oh, we apologize for having this very horrible thing that was put out there. Oh, oh well, my money's not going there anymore, you know. So my dollar is really how I, I um, consider my activism and what I support other artists that I um, believe in as far as they do a great work, whether it's from clothing, whether it's selling a painting, I'm gonna put my dollar somewhere where I feel like it's being valued. And so for me, that's really how I, um, I guess, have my activism. And I would, I would just uh, add an element, um, as you were speaking prior, we had the soundtrack, and I think that was your baby in the back, just like, ah, it's my baby, I'm gonna go know get that her. You're there, <laughs> oh, and it's we my really baby, actually, oh, yes, I was about to go get her. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, that's what I'm saying. The baby heard your voice, and the baby got quiet, it's like, that's mama talking, right? So I just wanna acknowledge that, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyone, and anybody, you all do not have to answer that. It was just a question and put it out there, you know. Um, anyone, anyone else want to answer? You can. If not, we can go to the next question. Yeah, I, mean, I want, oh, you, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll take a, a stab at it. I mean, I, 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 I really kind of cringe sometimes when people consider me an activist. You know, it's a word that I don't really take lightly. And it's not really to put judgment on anybody else and their views on, on activism and being an activist. Mm -hmm. It's more so just my personal choice, you know, like, I think sometimes the lines get blurred and, and muddled, you know, there are people doing certain things just because they have a platform and they want to keep that platform going, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it confuses sometimes the, the politic or the people um, when we put artists of a, in, in certain spaces like that. And one example I can kind of point to from my own personal experience is I was asked to do a, a public art project or a mural for the Lennontown Committee project. I didn't feel comfortable going in there getting paid to do a mural when the Lennontown Committee has not even, um, the descendants of Lennontown has not been redressed economically for the harm that has been done to them. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in those spaces as an artist, you, you have to be careful uh, the different lines you blur because you end up confusing people. If, if I would have went forward and did that mural for Lennontown, the community would have been like, oh, we did a mural for Lennontown, like it's over now, you know, we've yeah. done something for the black community. Like, no, yeah. we need actual redress, economic redress. Yeah. Uh, I do consider myself a, a community organizer, but that's because some of the experiences and the things I've witnessed and the, the passion and drive I have within me, I, I couldn't stay silent anymore about certain things that was happening. People were telling me certain things about what was going on in the school system or what was going on in housing or even from my own lived experience growing up in poverty, some of the same things are going on right now in the, in the neighborhood where my studio is located. And um, I, I very intentionally do not blur the two lines um, because there are a lot of people like watching, asking me questions and, and trying to put me in certain spaces um, in certain ways and I, I just, I'm constantly mindful of that. And I really didn't even like start doing political art until I think it was um, Tamir Rice when he was gunned down, you know, um, that really broke my spirit. And I, I really had to really put that energy because I was angry. I was frustrated. I was frightened in, in some ways. And I had to put, pour that energy into something and I decided to pour it into the art. And so I started put, creating like political pieces, but at the same time, uh, I really, I was careful about the language I used around the art and how I position the art, because I don't want to want people to think that the art is the means to the end. Mm. The art is a, about raising awareness and having a strong dialogue about it and calling systems out. Then you have to also do the work though to change those systems, mm. you know? And that's what activism is about, I feel like. Like uh, the work of Dr. King he, after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he continued to do work. Mm -hmm. He didn't sit back and just get paid to go to speaking gigs. Mm -hmm. He went down to, uh, what was it, uh, Memphis to organize those sanitation workers. And so he understood a bigger picture, the economic piece that was at stake about how black people were positioned in this society and the exploitation that happens in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, it's... It's complicated for me. No, no, no. <laughs> you know? Well said, though. I, 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 yeah, I really it's, it's appreciate you uh, like clarifying that because I think that line often do get blurred. Mm -hmm. And it becomes dangerous when we look to 
uh, entertainers and we look to turn artists to say, well, this person is going to, uh, this is the activism, this is the activist that's going to lead the way. And it's like, okay, you play a role, right? Mm -hmm. You can color, you can raise awareness, but there are boots on the ground. There are people that are really engaged in the process. So I really appreciate you clarifying, yeah, clarifying I'm gonna, that. I'm going to second that too, because uh, everything that you just now said, like, I feel the same way. And um, the, the, the main word that you kept on using was work. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like, I know, I, I don't consider myself an activist, but both of you guys' points, right? It's, it's just like, there's certain jobs you won't take because of the, the, the morality that you stand for or what you, how strongly you feel about something else. So it's just like for you saying that and just posting something on Instagram or Facebook and saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, that's, that's not work. You know, yeah. you're just doing it for a hashtag. And to me, myself, I don't shoot, I don't do any of that because to me, that's not my lane. Not everybody could, you know, do that work. I know where my strength is. It's like what Tab was saying. It's just like, I'm not going to support certain groups or certain organizations. I'm not going to give them my money. I'm not going to give them my time, nor my attention. And I know I don't have the time nor the, the, the know-how to put in the work to be an activist. So it's just like, not every black person, not every black artist is an art, uh, activist. Mm. Just because you feel strongly about certain things. I feel strong. I'm not really political because I could care less left or right. I don't care, you know? But it's, it's the, the, the simple fact of, just because you do art and you're black does not make you an activist, nor do you need to feel that you have to go out there and march because you might not, now you're leading other people. If you don't know, I don't know everything. So I can't go out there and start, you know, leading a revolution and I have no idea what I'm talking about. So it's just like what you were saying, Broderick, the work. And it's just like to be an activist, it's, it's work and you have to put in that work and you have to know what you're doing. So, and I definitely agree with you and same thing with Tab. So, yeah. Respect that. And I would have to piggyback off what you said because as a mother, you know, when I was coming along, I tried to prepare, I tried to prepare my children for what was out there. And so I wanted them to be prepared to think of themselves, not follow the crowd. Mm -hmm. and just because somebody say jump, you know, you don't say ha ha. You just think of yourself, use your own uh, brain cells and decide if this is right for you or if maybe some other form of, of that is right. Like you, I put mine uh, in my pocketbook. You know? <laughs> um, I do a lot of activism with my pocketbook. You, you may not get my money. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you know why you're not getting it. <laughs> because I just won't stop giving you my money. I have to let you know why you're not getting it. So um, that is, economics is a form of activism everybody can understand. And so um, my kids are like that now, thank goodness, because I tell them, you don't let somebody treat you any kind of way, I and mean, then you still go buy something from their store. That's what's the point. They're still going to treat you like they want to treat you. Show them that you don't really need them. You can go someplace else and buy your apples and your vegetables and your, and your clothes or whatever. So that's why the boycott worked so well, you know, the, um, the boys boycott, because nobody rode buses like over a year. Yeah. And that's why it worked because the money, you know, money yeah. talks. No, I, I do believe. I do. Be sorry to cut you off, like, but I do believe art can activate and does have a space within the movement. Mm -hmm. um, like there are several artists that did posters in you know, the civil rights yeah, movement. Exactly. There are several artists that did posters for other movements, um, Cuban, yeah, Cuban movements. Um, there, you know, were photographers during the civil rights movement that that really captured and cataloged. Um, what was going on and, and showed the rest of the community like these things are happening, you know So the artist has his place mm -hmm. and I do feel like the artist is more of a historian in a lot of ways mm -hmm. in those instances mm -hmm. like documenting the present the now mm -hmm. um, in, in some cases in some ways and so I, I really don't you know I, I, I appreciate the role of the artist for what it is, you know and being an art, uh, African-American artist black artist um, however you identify um, you know, it's, it's important and I, I was thinking earlier too, like before I was coming here, just about the Harlem Renaissance and like how some of those artists, um, you know, had a, played, a, played such a key role in paving the way for artists such as myself. But it's interesting that I did not know some of those names that I know now that I'll speak to later, mm -hmm. but I still developed the same sense of being as an artist that they had. So what does that say about our society mm. and where we are, you know? Yeah. Mm.
so that was just something I was thinking about earlier. Yeah, and one, one last thing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons that I became involved um, with the US group. There used to be a group in Athens called the US group. It was organized by Marie Cochran and Rodriguez Davis and Jocelyn um, Warren and Jerusha Graham. Um, a whole lot of people were involved in that. They started the Ever Rights Festival and they did some other things in Hot Corner and and um, that was uh, that was a movement. All those students were at the Lamar Dodd School of Art and they their art spoke and they were present in the moment for that and they reached out to a lot of people in the community, me being one of them and and that's why I became involved with the with the US uh, project. They did uh, exhibitions at the Linden House. They did other exhibitions around town. So that was a really, really forceful group. And they had a message, and they gave that message. And a lot of them now are living successful lives. I know that Rodriguez Davis, the head of the art and music performance department at Grambling State University, I mean the head of it. Mm. And um, uh, Jerusha Graham is in Atlanta doing her her print work, and I mean, all of these folks are, you know, they they're, they made a difference, and they're still making a difference mm. in their work. Mm. And Broderick, I really appreciate what you said about mm -hmm. the idea of the difference between an activist and a historian. Right. Like the artist's job is to capture the moment, is to let the moment be seen, so generations later mm -hmm. can either pick up where you left off or go beyond. Right. So appreciate that, brother. Well, what I wanted, I, I have so many questions because so I'm learning for y'all. So little time. <laughs> like, so many questions, so little time, um, especially being an artist myself. Project, no, I, I used to call him my mentor. <laughs> but um, my question is, I know through the pandemic, through, through COVID and everything, I think most of my art came out after George Floyd. Mm. I painted a picture called I Can't Breathe. And... It sold, and I was shocked by it, but it was like me in water, and I was suffocating. And because I took time to say I really felt like I couldn't breathe every day walking out of the house. But my question is, how did the killings of last year affect you, and did you let it motivate your art? Is that a good question? Did it influence like, your did, art? Did it influence your art? Let me get this over with. Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin affected me in, in ways that I'll never get over. Mm. Um, being that young, being in his own neighborhood, um, and, and just being brought down. And then um, Zimmerman being just let off. You know, you, you, you pull out a gun and shoot somebody for being in their own neighborhood and you're found innocent by a jury of your peers. You know, that I'll never get over that because he's still dead. Mm. And that bothers me to this day. And I did a painting of that, and uh, the best thing in that painting was the bullet hole that, um, that I uh, drew. And I, I spent so much time you know, with watercolor making that bullet hole look realistic, yes. because I have a son, and it, it, it still kills me, it breaks me up. I, and I, I bought the book that his parents wrote, and I still cry when I think about how old he would be, and and uh, the same with uh, what was his name? You remember him back in the um, the day he was killed by the um, the Klan in Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Yeah, that <clears throat> that came back because oh, it was almost circle. like here I go again. Here's this young Emmett Till, and now here's Trayvon Martin. You know, so. You know, I'll never get over it, but I'm done. Thank you for your answer. I know it's deep. <laughs> um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck to say this, and I apologize, and I really do. But it's one of those situations where you said, how did the, the killings last year affect the art, or how did it affect me? I'm going to speak for myself personally. It's sad, but it's just like, it was one of those things where it's just like, oh, yeah, I knew it was going to happen. So it's just like, I was not surprised, you know? And it's just like, everybody was up in arms, but I'm just like, yo, they do this all the time. So it's just like, what's the point of getting up? And I know, and again, I apologize, I know. But at the same time, it's just like, for me, 
I was not shocked. I was not surprised. It was just like, of course, I'm frustrated because it's just like, look at this senseless killing. This is not, and that's the thing too, right? We look at like police brutality and all type of nonsense or senseless taking of life of innocence, period. It doesn't matter if it's from the police or if it's from spouse or from whatever it is. All of that stuff affects me because that's a life being taken, right? So it's just like in this situation where, you know, young black men, young black women is being, life is being taken by police, it's just like, well, yeah, of course. That's where the police was made to take us out. So it's just like I'm not shocked and it's sad to say that, but it's just like, you know, tomorrow it could happen again and everybody's going to go up in arms. I'm like, well, oh, that's, you know, added on the marker. And it, it, it's, it's, it, I really apologize for saying that, but it's just like, it's one of those things where it's, I don't feel like there's, there's so many things that needs to be done, right? But the, the little things here and there, it's like, imagine dropping the ice cream. You're on the beach, dropping it on the, um, on the sand. And you're just trying to pick off this, you know, hey, let's get the, the sand off. You know, you're trying to wipe it off. You're trying to blow it off, put it in the water. You know, it's, it's still messed up. You kind of have to get a new ice cream. So it's just like all these things that we're trying to do to, to, to say, hey, let's reform this. Let's change this. It's like you need to get rid of everything, build fresh. So it's just like, and it's, it's sad to say that, but it's just like I don't see any change in the way that this system is built and the way that this country is run and the mindset of every single individual in this country. So it's just like, yeah, when it happened, and yeah, it did not affect my heart, it, I mean, my art, but it affected me as a person because I'm just like, that's another innocent life gone, black or white, it doesn't matter. So it's just like, for me as an artist, it did not affect me, but it's still senseless killing all around. So yeah, that's just how I feel about it. And let me just say, the reason I say that is because, or asked that question was, I don't know if you all know, but when someone gets shot, their their face go where? It goes on a shirt. Mm -hmm. So that helps make other people money. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I asked that question, because sometimes it takes a death just to um, have an income, which is sad. So that's why I ask that question is because once that person passes, is it becomes tattoos, it becomes uh, shirts, clothes, shoes. So I wanted to ask you all, how did it make you feel or how, you know, did it influence you? And that's, you a, that's that time? a good point because it's just like profiting off of somebody else's pain, right? You, um, like, you, uh, oh my goodness, my brain just blanked. What was his name? Look. Zimmerman, he killed uh, Trayvon, Martin. Trayvon, Trayvon Martin. Martin. Everybody had the Trayvon Martin hoodies, right? So you had to buy them. So you're profiting off of this mother, her child mm -hmm. just died to death, you know? And it's just like, it's the same thing. I remember when the pandemic first started, like right before it really got serious, everybody was coming to tab. It's like, oh, you should make some cool design uh, face mask. And I was just like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to profit off of something that, granted, we still didn't know all the information yet, but we're not going to profit off of this because why? It's, it, I don't know. So it's just like when you're saying that it, it is frustrating because, yes, people are profiting from this. You know, somebody somewhere is going to profit off of death, you know. So it's just like it's sad. But, you know, it's, this is it's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. Mm -hmm. you know? Thank you. Roger, I see you thanking Rhea, Rhea deeply. <laughs> oh, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm waiting for a more positive question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it seems like we're going down a rabbit hole now. You know, <laughs> I, and, like, I guess to answer the question, I was I was numb when it happened by that point, um, when George Floyd happened. Like, it had yeah, been so many so um, string back to back to back. I did have a response, though. It was prior to George Floyd and, like, the, the murders that happened through the pandemic. Um, and I, I was a part, I did a, a show, an art show at uh, the Tiny Ath Gallery. And um, uh, I did a piece that had a black rose in it. And um, I, I had these, um, I had someone do some research for me, a good friend of mine, um, to look up all the dates um, of police killing of unarmed African Americans in the United States. And I wrote each of those dates on a uh, on a plastic baggie and I, I had like pennies and I put like different amounts of pennies in the baggies and I stuck the the baggies to the wall around the black rose um, and and so the the meaning of the piece uh, really kind of spoke to speaks to uh, the value of black life mm. um, and really kind of examining as a society, like, do we really value black lives, you know? Um, and it was kind of like a, 
like a uh, what do you, what do you call the thing you you set up when somebody passes like a obituary not an obituary but like an altar or like a memorial memorial type thing to those people that had lost their lives you know um, and so I didn't I didn't really intend to sell the piece and it was actually a piece that I kind of repurposed um, but it was more like an installation in response to some of those killings and so um, yeah. Well, to reverse the, the, the energy, we're going to open up um, to the... Yeah, so so um, we, we we're definitely going to open it up, definitely. Thank you so much for that question, and I think it, it, it also, you know, it, and this is what comes in, in the skin we in, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, we got to walk with this pain, right? And we got to find ways to release that pain and not let that pain just kind of drown us. And the saying goes, so the longer we hold it, the heavier it becomes. Right. Right. And some of us are just walking ourselves into a ground. So finding an avenue to release. And I want to, you know, Broderick, I got this thing and I've done I've been, man, me and Broderick go back. Right. We, we've done a lot of work. We've gone way back. Uh, Chess and community. He's been um, instrumental in the first early stages of helping to establish and create it. And I can go back because I used to always ask the question, Broderick, you are putting your art. And because I, I recognize, we know uh, the census tract 301, 302, right? East Athens community. If Athens have a code, East Athens has the flu, right? We, we understand the level of poverty um, in census tract 301, 302. But in the midst of that, Broderick put his art studio there, right? So for me, it was like, okay. This has nothing to do with money. It doesn't have anything to do with money. And it has everything to do with how do we inspire another generation? How do we provide a platform where children that are pouring in from those communities can heal, can find a way to heal? And I've watched it happen in real time. Right? So um, I, I want to, if anything, just point to a, a, a way of, of why art is such a powerful medium, right? Um, me being a, a therapist, a counselor, and working with families in the community, and Broderick, Broderick had a platform in where the families were allowed to come into this space despite what they saw outside. That is a reflection of what's going on inside, right? So we can say, well, we don't want to be in this community. That is a reflection of Athens, and all of it is beautiful in its own way, right? So Broderick would offer these spaces where I brought this mother and his daughter into this space, and they just had a lot, it was a lot of generational trauma, a lot of pain that was directed at each other. And art was the medium that we chose to bring this mother in, as though you remember this, bring them into the spot, into the space, and allow them to just paint this rose, right, growing from concrete with jazz, this calm music playing in the background. And both of them had to take time and draw the picture together, right? So the beauty of that, and now they were able to hang this picture on their walls, right? So the beauty, so every time we find that we're ready to just go at each other's throat, we have a space, something that can help us come back to our center. So... I, that within itself, and it happens most, I brought my family to the studio and we painted and we drew and we did different things. And I say all this to say, when we're talking about another generation, right, who is experiencing you know, nothing the way what, of what we, you know, what was experienced in segregation, but deeper, all, same level of, it's just hidden, it's transformed, it's diff, took different, fo different forms. How do you speak to another generation of youth if 100 years from now, 70 years from now, they get a chance to see this video, the video that is being shot? What do we say to those youth that is going to find this video 100 years from now? What do you say to those young artists? <laughs> Let's go there. You gonna put, put us on the spot like that? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, um, I guess I can start off if y'all don't mind. Um, I, I would say them to them to, uh, you know, don't don't be afraid to to try new things and, and find your, your why. Um, 
Like, if you, if you like to play video games and that's your passion, find out how to be in that industry, if that industry still exists 100 years from now. Um, you know, just to, to find their, their why and what drives them. Um, that is something that changed my life. Um, being able to discover my passion and being able to use my passion the way I use it, um, like life was just speaking to, um, the energy that I pour into my craft and the, and the arts um, and, and the community and, and finding ways to, to meld those things together in some instances uh, is, is so rewarding. And uh, I, I can't really even describe it, uh, but that is a feeling that I want for, for everyone to discover, you know, uh, finding out how to take what you love to do and... Uh, what's that thing that I think is a Japanese word, ikigai or something like that? The, the model of like what you do for a living, what you love to do, what you do for vacation. Um, like when I look at that chart, I feel like I'm, uh, you know, almost there to that like, you know, blissful, blissful place, that, that moment, you know, of like the convergence of all those different aspects of my life, you know, what I do for work. It's so fulfilling to me, you know, when I'm in a, in a creative space and working with kids and working in community with people. Um, so I would encourage them to discover those things and find those things, um, you know, not necessarily with a sense of urgency per se, because um, it shouldn't be rushed, but for them to explore ways to find those things. And there's, that's art right here just sitting there, right for us. Right there. <laughs> the beauty right there, just the family. This is art in motion. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so your question was basically, how many years from now, what would we tell the kids? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just keep it short and sweet. Learn from us, you know? Mm. Learn from us. Learn from our mistakes, uh, from the past generation of mistakes, and don't make the same mistakes. You know, because it's just like we can look at history right now and we can look at all the mistakes that we continue to keep on doing. It's like none of this is new. Mm -hmm. The pandemic, the racial injustice, all of this stuff that's going on, even just how we feel about art. You know, granted, like when you were growing up, you know, there wasn't really art, black people. But at the same time, it's just like learn from it. You know, even just what we're doing right now is just like, so who knows next year, some kids will probably be watching this. You're like, you know what, I want to be an artist or I'm going to, you know, be in a panel next year. And that's my goal. So it's just like, just learn from it, you know, because 100 years from now, who knows, we might flying cars. So, yeah. <laughs> They'll probably be doing art in the metaverse, right? <laughs> exactly. Right, right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any, any, uh, anything else? Any, any, any addition to that or we're, we're good? <laughs> oh, oh, um, you know, I wrote something in the Crest Project mm -hmm. uh, for the George Museum of Art, and I just wanted to read it really, really quick. If um, the written word can tear out one's heart, it can embarrass, it can also heal. Writings about life are poignant in that an individual can absolutely lay the soul bare. Writings create dialogue and thereby invite critiques. Not all of it welcome. But what is said cannot be unsaid. No apologies. Only hope that we have all learned how forced denial is denial within us all. The all-seeing, all-knowing saints like St. Clair certainly knew of it and wisely looked over those of us who lived through it. As a writer of events, this is my reflection and my prayer. Mm. Oh, that Beautiful. I'm just trying to live through it. Just make every day. Yeah. Beautiful. You're, you're living. You're not trying. You're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> right. How are we looking on time? Got about 10, 15 minutes. So I, I, I would like to. It can, is it okay for yeah, us to I was going to open. I was first going to ask the artists how can we find them on their platforms. Yes. Uh, first of all, I love fashion. So I would love it, you know, <laughs> if you let me know. Um, so, yeah, I will open it up to the, the audience, but after they state where, where, where can we find you? Oh, let's do that at the end, so that way they can write it down okay. before they leave, right? Okay, so any questions? I'm sorry, is that, oh, yeah. that of you okay? Cool. Are there any questions? Yes. Can I just ask what you have to 
Can you repeat that? Yeah, when it comes to art and what would you like to see more of? Um, exhibits yeah. at different spaces. You know, right now everybody's just, you know, the Linden House or um, Ethica, to say that right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at different places. Um, you know, Athens is known for, for a lot, you know, but at, at one of those, I don't know, I'm just going to keep it short. It, yeah, more different, yeah. diverse places. Like, you know, have an exhibit in East Athens and have all of Athens come out instead of just East Athens, you know? So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, okay. That's it. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see more, like, art festivals that, that center the culture. Um, we have a music festival, the AFS Music Festival. We have a lot of those type of festivals. We have the Hot Corner Festival, which is great. Um, and so I would love to see like a, a, a arts festival that's uh, centered around like art, black artists or artists of color. Or, they have a lot of those in, in Atlanta and, and other places. Um, I, I would love to see a cultural event like that, an annual event. Not in February. Huh? Not in February. Not in February. <laughs> February. No, no, no. Maybe, maybe in June, June 10th. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else? Any, of but thanks. I have a, just a request that all of the artists on the panel, if you would be willing to come and speak to some older artists, because we would love to hear how you developed your art, how you chose the kind of art you did, and it wouldn't be in February. <laughs> um, at Wesley Wood Athens, which is about five miles from here, um, I'm particularly interested in how you chose the medium that you chose, whether it was um, watercolor, fashion, photography, or uh, acrylic oil paints. And uh, so, if you're willing to come, that will be the question. You can re <laughs> count on my, my asking that question. Mm, but okay. there are a bunch of old people over there, and they're interesting. Okay. And they're interested. So, I hope you'll come. I'll come. I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love you. You said interesting and interested. Yeah. I, like I, don't, I don't know. That sounds like work to me. I mean, I, <laughs> what's, the, what's the budget look like now? <laughs> Sound like consulting. Mm -hmm. but, yes. But Benny. Uh, Man, you got the bed. There's a girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Benny. I think all the power of Bell Athens. When I say that because I listen to a young man right now. And I know when he comes, they pitch him and they see him like, oh, you did this? Mm -hmm. I remember young lady on the end now. Um, she played for the work at the uh, Living House. She said, who did it? They turned out song. Oh, you did it? On the end, because of our mentality, we have what we see on TV, first they ain't going to think here, a rap. Mm -hmm. But they say, oh, you know, artist. So to me, they're all at it. Mm -hmm. Because they changed that image of mm -hmm. what a lot of people have of us, that, oh, you play sports. Mm -hmm. Are you a entertainer? Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody on play, but they got the image of mm -hmm. all black people are you doing sports mm -hmm. are entertainers. Mm -hmm. So from my point of view, mm -hmm. all of them are sports. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know every one of them have to find out who did it, they go, Oh, you did it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, actually really like, I actually really like that and I appreciate that because it happens to us all the time. <laughs> Especially Tab. Like Tab will have a piece. And somebody's like, you made that? You're like, yeah, I made it. No, seriously, did, did you, you make really that? Make that? <laughs> it's just like, we mm -hmm. go through that all the time. Same thing with my pictures. It's just like, oh, you didn't do that, did you? I was like, yeah. Oh, but it looks so good. Oh. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you definitely have to have tough skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Benny. <laughs> definitely. Mr. Ben, I love that bed. That bed, that's, uh, that's a good look for you. <laughs> love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any okay. other that's, questions? That's, that's wisdom. It's wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. We're right almost there. All right. So if we can, can we just get uh, where can they find your work? If somebody's interested to learn more about what you're doing, your work, social media, email address, 
uh, where can they find that? Maybe not your number. You don't want somebody to <laughs> grab it and try to harass, call, and all that kind of stuff. But where can they find your work? Um, they can find the the um, the Chris book at the Jordan's and Bart gift store. Okay. They can um, find my work mostly now in private collections. Okay. <laughs> um, and soon at the Linden House, as soon as it starts back again with this gift shop. So. So if somebody wants to summon you to do a work or anything, can they contact you or you're kind of not available in that space right now? No, I don't do okay. commissions. Okay. It's just too much pressure. I got you. Do you okay. have any social media platforms? I mean, you know, thank you so much for asking that because no. I do. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't do Facebook. Uh, I have uh, an email. Okay. That's about the only way people can, can get in contact with me. And, and my name is Par Ramey, so it's Par Ramey at hotmail.com. Uh -oh. Okay, you still got hotmail. <laughs> <laughs> Notice how generic that is. Nah, it's cool. So it's P-A-R-R-A-M-E-Y at hotmail.com. Okay. And you can get in touch with me through that email. Okay. And I have a Facebook page as well. Okay. So that's where they can find me. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you can. I mean, you discriminate against it, men, it, it, but you know, I'm it's, sorry. it's cool though. I'm sorry. No, I'm Look, joking. Joking. he's the main one always like, come on. Me. Come on, man. I need, I need a nice I know suit always going, on, man. But I need know? a good designer. Okay. Um, menswear. Um, <laughs> but this may sound weird, but you can literally Google my name and everything will pop up. Um, I don't want to sound All like, right. You Google me. You know, wow. Like, <laughs> Google me. Like, uh, I don't wow. want to sound like that at all. But it's my YouTube, my Facebook, my Instagram. Um, I also teach at Linden on Tuesdays, so if you just forget everything, just come to Linden on What's Tuesday. What's your name? Tabitha Felto. Um, yes. Um, and also, um, if you, anybody ride motorcycles in here? <laughs> so, uh, you do. Okay. Okay. You, okay. okay. So, we, are you, you ride too? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, nice. I have a brand. We have a brand together. It's called Chic Riot, and it's motorcycle gear for women. Um, okay. Yeah. Dope. Dope. Awesome. All right, you guys can find me at Fell2 Photography, um, Instagram, and all You know what? Hold on. I'm sorry. Can I give uh, my shout-outs to my daughter? Her name is Jaden Felto. She's <laughs> actually an artist and a writer published. Woo! So. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's big. That's big. She's 14. She's, uh, she wants to be a digital artist when she grows up. She nice. published her first book last year. It yeah, sold out. Awesome. She got some more coming, working on book two. So shout out. I'm going to give my shout out to my daughter. <laughs> That's Art by Jaden on Instagram. So Art by Jaden. Yeah. And That's what I'm talking about. Respect. Respect. Um, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram, um, Flanagan's Portrait Studio. Um, the email is also Flanagan's Portrait Studio at gmail.com. This is how you spell Flanagan, F L A N I G A N, not A G A N. Um, and I, I have a bunch of projects coming up actually. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do a plug for, for one of them. It's a big project. Uh, I've become pretty ambitious. You know, I, I dream big as an artist um, go big or go home, right? right. Um, so I'm working on a project with, uh, in partnership with the Housing Authority. As you know, they've gotten a bunch of uh, public monies to redevelop Bethel Homes. Um, I was able to convince them to allow me to come in and take over some of those apartments mm -hmm. while they're in the redevelopment phases and, allow, and bring in artists. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a stable of artists that I'll be bringing in, not to compare artists to horses. Let me take, retract that statement. Um, I have a, a list of artists that I'll be bringing in uh, to hang artwork, do installations, paint murals on the walls, potentially on the outside of the buildings. And then after, there, there's going to be an exhibit, of course. And then after the exhibit is over, the demolition schedule will resume. They'll tear the buildings down and then rebuild new buildings in the space. Um, cool. mm. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I stole that idea. You know, they say great artist steal. I stole that <laughs> idea from an artist in Atlanta. He did a similar project at an industrial building in, uh, in Atlanta. And uh, I consulted with him. He allowed me to take that idea and apply it to this project in Athens. I'm in fundraising mode, though, for that project. Um, and let me tell you the, the most important piece of that project is I'll be, 
I'll be training uh, and hiring people that live in, in Bethel Homes in that community as cultural workers. Yes, yes. So, yes, and I'll be paying yes. them $20 an hour to be docents mm. and to work with the artists so the artists can inform their work. And so the overall budget is about 36000 So far, I've raised about seventeen, And I need some big checks. <laughs> so if you know some friends with some big checks, uh, send them my way. Um, I, I'm not taking a lot of small donations, nothing against small donations, but it's an accounting nightmare, and I will have to have a fiscal agent and whatnot, which I am working with a fiscal agent. But um, again, ten to $15,000 of that budget, though, is going to pay the people that live in Bethel Homes. Um, and so those are the type of projects that I'm, I'm engaged in. Uh, I've been doing some of those projects on a smaller scale, but this is a, my most ambitious project to date. It's going to happen sometime this fall, and I've already gotten the green light from the housing authority. So it's, it's going to happen either way, uh, but I need some support in the funding piece. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes. All right. Oh, also, um, I didn't really get to circle back around to my earlier statement about the artists that paved the way during the hardest renaissance. renaissance. It's, it's important to say their names, yes. Um, Jacob Lawrence, uh, Benny Andrews. Uh, Faith Ringo, uh, Emma Amos, uh, she was a part of Spiral, the only woman that was in Spiral, artist collective started in the Harlem Renaissance with Romeo Bearden, Bearden and, and other artists. Um, Jacob Lawrence, if I haven't mentioned his name already. Uh, David Driscoll, David Driscoll, he's featured in the HBO film, uh, Black Art, uh, The Absence of Light, Black Art in America, something like that. It's a great documentary on HBO. Uh, he did a he did a um, exhibit uh, called "A Hundred Years of Black Art." Um, black artists have always been around. We just haven't been given our due process and our recognition. And so I, I like to pay homage to all those artists who laid the groundwork for me to do what I'm doing today. Even though I didn't know their names growing up, as I learned more about my craft and my my field and and, and become more um, learned in that area. Uh, it's important for me to pay homage to them and to speak to that lineage. Um, artists like Kerry James Marshall, if you're familiar with him, he, he was informed and inspired by Jacob Lawrence and Charles White and those other artists. And so if you don't know these names, become familiar with these names um, because it's important um, in, in the history of, of black artists, you know, or artists in general, uh, but they are artists that happen to be black and amazing. So. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there and say that piece as well. So I appreciate them, appreciate artists like Parr, as well as uh, artists that are regional to Athens, like Abner Cope, John Ahey, uh, my art teachers in high school, uh, Ms. Campbell, uh, Mr. Barnett, uh, Barnett. Yeah, Mr. Jeff Barnett over at Clark Central, yes, yes. Mr. Armel Stroud, Stroud yeah. who I'm in communication with, who has a space on, uh, who is that? Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon? I'm not familiar with Mr. Moon. Now we got a new name. Yeah, now we got a new name to add to the list. You know, and so all these people poured into me as I pour into future generations. So I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't really thank them and also, um, you know, share that on this, this platform. Yeah, well, that's well said. Well yeah. said. Carol so, uh, Rittenberry. Carol Rittenberry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Can't forget about Mr. Rittenberry. There are a lot of us here. Of course. Miss that I, yeah, that I yeah. painted, yeah. Mm -hmm. She bought that <laughs> right, right out of the Linden house. So just, just so we can respect <laughs> yeah. the time, I know we are artists and we are going to color the world beautiful. And when we were doing art, time escapes, escapes. <laughs> right? There is no time, right? right? But in this case, I'm going to the library is going to close down. So, <laughs> so we're going to have to respect the time. But I, would, with, I want to first take a moment to thank you all yes. for coming out and joining yes, us you. in this panel. Thank you again, the library, for putting on such an important, for creating a space where we can have this dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, my artist, my co-host, Miss Makisha Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank right? you. Thank and you. I would, Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah. Thank give you. thanks. Give thanks. And I would close with these words. These are the, a quote from Ozzie Davis. He says, any form of art is a form of power. It has impact. It can affect change. It can not only move us, it makes us move. So use the words, use the passion, use what you heard on the stage tonight, 
and allow it to make you all move and let's color Athens beautiful again. Yes. All right?